Welcome back to History of Graphic Narratives. Today we're going to look at the very famous Rudolf Topfer. And I say very famous because he plays a, a seminal role in creating what we now call the modern comic. It is, without a doubt, his innovations in the 19th century dramatically shift what people think is possible with telling stories with pictures. He had aspirations to be a painter like his father, Adam Wolfgang Topfer, who was a fairly uh, famous landscape painter, but his eyesight uh, was not as fine as required to make such uh, detailed paintings, and so he turned to becoming a novelist, and in his own right he was a fairly uh, well-known novelist. At the time, he started to experiment with his picture stories. Now, originally, the picture stories were a kind of private matter, something he did just for fun with his students. And they get the attention of a very famous man of letters, who was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. If you haven't heard of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, then you are in for a treat. He is an extraordinary writer who became very famous intellectual in Germany in the 19th century. Goethe was getting on in years, and one of the, his many friends was a mutual acquaintance of Topfer's, and he brought to Goethe some of these uh, pages that Topfer had made of his picture stories. And Goethe really liked them, and he uh, sent word back to Topfer that he should publish them, because there was something very novel and original in their creation. As he said, it really is too crazy and strange, but it really sparkles with talent and wit. He enjoyed the way the pictures moved across the page as if you were watching a play. And one of the things that Topfer had done in his picture stories is instead of taking a page and drawing a picture and telling the story with words, he began to splice up the page into various sized panels. And in each of those panels, different pictures would occur. And so we would start to sort of compare one picture to another and we would start to see the story kind of unfold in a more quick, quicker manner. Now, Topfer did not indicate that he was inspired by anyone else other than Hogarth. He saw some of Hogarth's prints, which were a hundred years earlier, and he liked this idea of telling stories with pictures. But Hogarth, you can see, is really quite different. He creates a, a kind of richly realized sort of picture into a world like a stage play. And Topfer is doing something quite different. He's drawing much more loosely in a much more gestural way, and he's putting words and pictures together in combinations, and he's splicing up his panels so we read it more quickly. So there's a huge leap in conventions between Hogarth and Topfer. And Topfer really sort of brings to bear this new kind of genre. And instead of this sort of serious moral stories, we have these kind of lighthearted, fanciful, outrageous social commentaries. So really Topfer was creating a kind of mixed genre, um, something a bit of a farce, something a little bit of a fantasy, a satire, a romance, adventure, all kind of Paul together. Uh, here we see the, from the story of Monsieur Jabot uh, from 1831. Monsieur Jabot is sleeping. He sleeps with one eye open and he is dreaming of mazurka music. And we actually see the musical notes 
drifting in and out of his head. He's also imagines himself this great lover and he defeats with one blow all of the suitors that were also attending to this woman of his fancy. And so this kind of crazy mixed up storytelling is what made it so fun and so innovative and so very different from anything else that had ever really been made before. Well, not entirely. Uh, one of the things that may have been a kind of inspiration to Topfer was an earlier novel uh, by a British writer, Lawrence Stern, which was enormously famous and had been translated into many languages. It was sort of satirical and absurd uh, story of life and opinions of Tristan Shandy. Now, in Lawrence Stern's novel, he uses this sort of uh, ridiculous constructions, uh, stretching out of time of things that would normally take a moment and condensing down vast amounts of time in a few sentences. And this sense of time in Lawrence Stern is a kind of playful thing that he is messing with. And that may have been part of where um, Topfer gets his idea for this sort of innovative way of putting events together in this kind of cut-and-paste sort of way. The panels that Topfer used are especially important. It's a time-based humor. He's splicing up these moments in ways that we are aware of the size of the panel. Take, for example, here in the story of Albert, from 1845, how we have Albert, who is now selling encyclopedias, and he's coming to door to door, and you see him there uh, once selling it to the family, and then again and again, the repetition of those same moments now, we see Albert smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, in that sense of ad infinitum, a kind of dot, 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 going on and on, um, without end. Repetition is this really kind of fun element in Topfer. The other thing that Topfer is doing is that he's really into showing gesture and action and movement through caricature. Caricature was the thing that Hogarth despised and he wanted to create this rather kind of serious you know, social commentary with the sense of drama and real life people. Um, it, you know, with exaggeration and gesture as well. But in Topfer, there's a kind of fun and abandon. Here, his characters uh, are caught up on a, a windmill, and the windmill goes faster and faster, creating wind that blows the sheep uh, out. Uh, it through the sky. So there's a sense of the movement, you see the wheel now spinning at great, great speed, and everything has this kind of urgency and speed and the absurd. As I mentioned, repetition happens within a page, the characters repeat again and again and again, and then over a story, a character will return to the same action again and again and again. Notice the red panels here, I'm marking off moments in the story of the true story of Monsieur Curepin, where he is changing his shirt. Uh, he has a misadventure and he comes home and he changes his shirt. He has another misadventure and he goes home and he changes his shirt. Again, the changing of the shirt becomes this way in which the story never advances. Everything always seems to keep going back to some earlier state uh, and repeating itself over and over again in a rather absurd way. So in this way, even though we're seeing the same thing over and over again, because the story doesn't change in a way, we are starting to think differently about the character. If it had just happened once, we might take it more seriously. But the fact that it's repeated in this way, it starts to become more and more absurd. And this is a very important strategy for Topfer, one we might call montage. Take, for example, here. On this one page, we have his character, Monsieur Pencil, and Monsieur Pencil is drawing, and he's admiring his p 
picture. He admires it from one direction. He admires it over his shoulder. And this way in which that admiration he is demonstrating of his own work. It's not just something we might say, oh, he likes what he drew. Instead, we get this kind of vanity and absurdity from the repetition. And so the meaning of these pictures are not individually significant, but cumulatively they come create a new meaning. And this is where I use the word montage, which is a series of things or a collection of things put together in a deliberate sequence that creates new kind of meaning out of that collective understanding. So there's a sequence involved here where you have this kind of movement through the panels and the relative size and shape of the panels matter to our understanding of the meaning and the way in which there's a kind of new meaning that is generated by having read several panels in succession. And this is the thing that is really the hallmark of the modern comic. This is the thing that defines what comics are today, is what Topfer invented back in 1835. Now, you may say, well, hold on there. Topfer didn't quite get it all right. I mean, he's using words and pictures and panels on page spliced up in complex ways, but he's not using speech bubbles. And that is a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Because from his drawings, we can see that he understood what a speech bubble was. But it's also clear that he had some hesitation a reticence from using them in his publications, which he originally published anonymously. So that he was a man who was not too sure how his picture stories would be received initially. And as a man who is hoping to be inculcated into a society of letters, he was really very self-conscious about his reputation. So it may be this idea of this picture stories was just a little too frivolous, a little too absurd. And something about speech bubbles would have just kind of made it a little too much above even that. What we know about Topfer and his ideas about storytelling, he wrote down in an essay on physiognomy in 1845. And in this essay, he talks not about storytelling so much, but he does make some very interesting points. First of all, he says, when you're creating a picture story, you're creating a play. You're not just illustrating your story. You're using pictures and words together in this very uniquely theatrical way. More to the point, he's really interested in is it experiments with caricature. He starts to look at the way caricature creates images in our minds. Take, for example, the way he analyzes these sets of characters. First of all, he's interested in the fact that when we look at the characters on the top part of the page, we can all generally agree that they all look rather foolish and ridiculous even though they all have a fairly large head, which might suggest a large brain, which at the time meant that someone with a big head might have a lot of room for big ideas. When in fact, characters that he drew with sloping foreheads still looked smart if their jawline was strong. So he said, we judge intelligence not by the size of someone's head, but the strength of their jawline, which doesn't make any sense. What does a jaw have to do with someone's intelligence? And so his point finally was caricatures do not tell us something about the character. They do not reveal some intimate secret about the character. Instead, they tell us something about who we are. Caricatures are exaggerations of our own mental images of things. 
not a way of kind of realizing the essences of actual things out in the world. Now, another important thing that Topfer mentions in his essay is how fortunate it was as he was making his picture stories that a new technology had come on the scene. And that was the uh, invention of lithography, this new printing technique that allowed him to draw directly in a way that it could be reproduced. He didn't have to give it to someone else to cut or engrave. His own drawings immediately became the printed image. Now, to understand lithography, you have to understand that it's a rather novel idea for printing. You have this giant stone, hence the word litho, stone, and you draw on the stone with a wax crayon, and then you sort of fix the wax crayon to the stone through a chemical process. And then when you wet the stone, you take oil-based inks and you rub it across the stone. And everywhere you have wetted the stone and there is no drawing, no ink is applied. But every place where you have made a mark, the ink holds fast. And so then you can lay paper down on the stone and with pressure pull up uh, the image. Now the remarkable thing about lithography is it's incredibly fast. It's easy to make. Your drawing is immediately a part of the image that is reproduced. You don't have to cut or engrave or etch your image into the stone. You draw on it. And so the artist's mark becomes a very significant feature of the printed image. If we compare engraving from this uh, detail by Hogarth to lithography with this detail by Daumier, we can see that Daumier's line is looser. It really feels much more like his drawing. Whereas there's something at a remove with the engraving. The engraving is an image that is somehow a kind of finished image, something more fixed, something more precisely delineated. Whereas here, now we have natural shading and value, and we really feel the artist's mark on the page as they intended it to be seen. And so this is a really interesting change where the idea of drawing becomes a very important and expressive part of the image. And I think it was a very important part of Topfer's storytelling was that he could draw and write on the image at the same time, in the same style, in a way that created this kind of fun, irreverent kind of storytelling. Now, Topfer was extraordinarily successful in his picture stories. And today, this is what he is most known for. Even his novels, which gained him great reputation during his time, are nothing compared to the incredible popularity uh, of his picture stories, which were widely translated and copied and imitated and um, stolen and pirated by other people to print in other languages and other cultures far away. And so his legacy is quite large. We can see from this point forward, a lot of pages and things that start to look like comic pages. And it is from this impetus that many, a whole new generation of people working in this genre are coming about. In the United States, uh, the very earliest comics to appear uh, were translations of Topfer's comics. Uh, the title was changed, the story was altered and edited down, but essentially it was a reconstruction of Topfer's work. Uh, this Obadiah Old Buck was published in America in 1842 and for several decades was widely reprinted and disseminated 
throughout the United States.